What happens after Avatar The Last Airbender? Avatar The Last Airbender is easily one of the best and most popular series of all time. And yeah, we're huge fans. Since the show ended in 2008, a run of graphic novels have been released that follow up the hit cartoon and interestingly start to set up the world we see in Avatar's sequel, The Legend of Korra. Today's investigation will take a look at how these graphic novels continued the stories in The Last Airbender and established the world seen in The Legend of Korra. Just a heads up, if you want to experience the stories in these graphic novels for yourself, there will be spoilers in this video. We aren't going to go over every single tiny detail, but we will touch on major plot points and specifically the ways they tie to the two animated series in the Avatar franchise. And yes, these are considered canon. Creators Michael DiMartino and Brian Konitzko collaborated closely with the graphic novel's authors to break their stories, and DiMartino actually writes the Legend of Korra graphic novels himself. So there you go. The Avatar The Last Airbender graphic novels provide some seriously satisfying follow-ups to the TV series and plant some fascinating seeds that we later see flourish in The Legend of Korra. First up, Republic City. The first graphic novel trilogy called The Promise deals with some of the aftermath of Last Airbender's 100-year war. Over those 100 years, the Fire Nation established colonies in the conquered areas of the Earth Kingdom. When the war ended, many expected these colonies to be vacated, but most of the citizens who lived in the colonies had never known life outside of the Earth Kingdom. This temporarily put Aang and Zuko at odds over a solution. Ultimately, they realized that the people of these colonies were not of the Fire Nation or the Earth Kingdom, but had created their own culture and decided they should be allowed to govern themselves. In the third graphic novel trilogy, The Rift, we see the Fire Nation colony Yu Dao become the first to establish its new government. This places two people of Earth Kingdom ancestry and two of Fire Nation ancestry in equal roles in the government. This system seems to have continued into the age of Korra. In book one of that series, Republic City's government is run by a committee of representatives from every bending nation. That's how you do it, baby. Equal representation, y'all. Also established in The Rift is the existence of the Earthen Fire Refinery, an industrial production facility not far from Yudao. In Imbalance Part 1, we find that the town and surrounding industry began to flourish. This area became known as Cranefish Town, but if you look at the map of the developing city, you can see that it's the exact location of the future Republic City. Look, you can even see these little islands in the harbor, one of which would become Air Temple Island, and the other would be home to this massive statue of Avatar Aang. The Imbalance graphic novel trilogy still has two more upcoming entries, so we're curious to see how else they might further establish Republic City. Toph's Daughters. This part is a little bit speculative, but we wanted to throw our theory out there. In The Legend of Korra, Toph is shown to have two daughters by two different men, Lin and Su Yin. Though they do speak briefly about Lin's father, it is never revealed who Su's father might be. In the graphic novels The Rift and Imbalance, we meet Satoru, who is in charge of the aforementioned Earth and Fire Refinery. Satoru begins working very closely with Toph at the refinery, and they have a very friendly relationship. See any resemblance between Satoru and Su? Look at that hair. We think this guy could end up being Su Yin's father. Actually, hang on a second. I've got the results right here. Satoru, in the case of Su Yin, you are the father. Oh! Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> All right, let's keep going, I guess. <laughs> the Southern Water Tribe. In Avatar The Last Airbender, the Southern Water Tribe is basically a small series of igloos. It's very, very small. During the Hundred Year War, many of the tribe's adults were off fighting, but once the war ended, they returned and the small nation began to expand. In the graphic novels North and South, we see Katara and Sokka return to their home for the first time in two years, and they barely recognize it. This rapid industrialization helps bridge the gap between the tiny Southern Water Tribe of The Last Airbender and the massive society seen in The Legend of Korra. The Beifong Metal Bending Academy. Avatar The Last Airbender, Toph, becomes the world's first metal bender. And up until the end of the series, she remains the only person with this ability. It's awesome. In the Promise graphic novels, she begins teaching metal bending to other prospective students. After seeing some of her students in action, the police chief of the Fire Nation colony, Yu Dao, became interested in learning the skill as well. The idea of a police captain with metal bending abilities obviously worked out because we later learn that Toph herself would become Republic City's police chief along with an entire police force of metal benders. Toph's metal bending school explains how the ability became so widespread in the 70 years between the end of The Last Airbender and the beginning of The Legend of Korra. Boom. Zuko's mom. Okay, buckle in y'all because this is about to get sad. The fate of Ursa, Zuko's mother, was by far the biggest lingering story thread left by The Last Airbender series. Where is my mother? In fact, 
Series creators Michael Dante DiMartino and Brian Konitsko allegedly pitched this story to Nickelodeon as a made-for-TV movie, and Nickelodeon sadly declined. Instead, the creator started to focus on the forthcoming graphic novels as a way to explore this untold story. The last Zuko had seen his mother. She was fleeing the palace and the Fire Nation. Whew, here we go. The graphic novel series The Search follows up this story thread directly while also giving background on Ursa. We learned that when she was young, Ursa fell in love with a boy named Ikem. Sadly, Fire Lord Azulon later arranged her to be married to Prince Ozai, and Ursa had to part ways with Ikem. Though she was told she could not have any contact with her family or former friends after becoming Fire Princess, Ursa continued to exchange letters secretly with Ikem. Yeah, that's my girl, that's what's up, true love. When Ozai discovered this, he claimed to have ordered Ikem's death. Damn, this is heavy stuff. After Uncle Iroh's only son, Luten, died in battle, <clears throat> I'm not gonna cry, I'm gonna do it. Ozai asked his father, Fire Lord Azulon, to pass the birthright to the throne from Iroh to Ozai, making Ozai the next in line to become Fire Lord. What a piece of shit. Azulon ordered Ozai to feel the same pain Iroh felt by killing Zuko. This is one messed up family. This is some Game of Thrones shit. Like, uh, the Skywalkers? Yeah, that's cute. <laughs> I remember when I had my first beer. Get out of here. In order to save Zuko's life, Ursa struck a deal with Ozai. She crafted him an odorless and colorless poison and agreed to leave the Fire Nation capital forever. Ozai used the poison to murder his own father, Azulon, and Ursa fled the capital. Shortly after her banishment, Ursa met a man named Noren, who suspiciously knew more about Ursa than she had told him. Noren revealed to her that he was actually a chem, her former love. He explained to her that he had received a new face and identity thanks to a spirit called the Mother of Faces. Fun avatar fact, this spirit is also the mother of Ko, the face dealer. One of your previous incarnations tried to slay me maybe eight or nine hundred years ago. Ugh, creeps me out every time. Stop it, stop it, get it off the screen. Ursa also decides to change her face, but the Mother of Faces offers her another opportunity to forget her past completely and start anew. Ursa became Noriko, and she and Norin started a new life together, giving birth to a daughter named Kiyi. When Zuko finally began to search for Ursa, his mother, he, Azula, and the gang actually meet Norin and Noriko, but obviously Noriko doesn't remember Zuko or anything about her life as Ursa. Zuko learns the fate of Ursa from the Mother of Faces, and discovers the truth about Noriko. Azula confronts Noriko about her past as Ursa, accusing her of replacing Azula with her new daughter, Kiyi. After this, Noriko retreats to the Mother of Faces, regains her old face and all of her former memories. This leads to some huge complications in her new family, as her daughter, Kiyi, no longer recognizes her. But Zuko invites Ursa and her new family to live with him in the Fire Nation capital. <sighs> Look, that was good. Guys, we highly recommend that you go and check out these stories for yourself because we really only scratch the surface. Come on, they're full of your favorite characters. You know this. You know, you know you're gonna read them and be like, man, I missed out, they're so good. Part two of the current ongoing trilogy called Imbalance will hit comic book shops in May, so be sure to check that out when it drops. And that's where we wanna pass it off to you. What do you think about these last Airbender comics? Do you enjoy the continued adventures of Team Avatar? How do you feel about the ways that they set up the world in The Legend of Korra? Let us know below in the comments. And of course, you have to remember to check out Talkin' Tunes, Rob Polson's series all about voice acting. He's even had Korra herself, Janet Varney, in the studio reading Star Wars scripts. New episodes of Talkin' Tunes drop every Friday on projectalpha.com. Hey, thanks so much for tuning in to another animation investigation. If you like this episode, make sure to comment, like, share the video with your fellow Avatar fans, and tune in every Thursday for more. That's gonna close another case. We'll catch you on the next animation investigation. I don't know why I just did that just now, but maybe this is my new thing.